If you loved the movie Twilight, then just wait for its sequel, The Twilight Saga New Moon, which proves to be jarringly long-winded and inconsistent. And I'm just talking about the sudden change in title structure for the whole franchise. Now I have to say fancy words like saga, plus like six extra syllables and punctuation? Ugh, okay, college. I guess I'll have to go to night school so that I can try to understand the rest of these movies. But it's weird how they went from being a single word to the Chronicles of Twilight Narnia part two, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. However, if you survive reading the title, New Moon reunites us with Bella, Edward, and Jacob, and one particularly uncomfortable triangle. That's what I call Alice's hairstyle that we have to see so much of in this movie. Why does she always look like she works at a luxury car dealership in Rome? Whatever, we'll try to get to the bottom of that in between all of the C and D storylines that this movie has should have been cut, CGI wolf stuff that should have looked more expensive, and of course, more of our newly barely legal protagonist, Bella Swan, as she stammers through her every sentence while staring dead-eyed at people with bad wigs and horrible dye jobs. There is no romance like a Twilight romance, meaning absolutely riddled with plot holes. So let's get into it. In today's The Twilight Saga installment of Clip Breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we break it into clips and decide, is that a part one of the saga part four or part two of the saga next door? I got really upset about the titles on this because it just feels like they decided after the first movie came out that they needed to really keep that Twilight name in there. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about it. But before we do, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already because I upload two new videos every week and you don't want to miss the saga. I like saying saga that way. I love when I'm doing one of these movies and I have something to say right off the like title card. Is anyone else getting a really negative vibe from that navel orange? To me, it just seems dark-sided, floating in the abyss and dark on one side. Shout out to Stephanie Meyer, the author of Twilight, for introducing so many young readers to fascinating concepts from the world of astronomy. All of the symbolic titles of her book series actually describe the scientifically accurate phases of the moon. First, we have twilight, which is when light is getting scattered by the sun below the horizon. New moon, which is when the sun and the moon are both visible at the same time. Eclipse, when the moon blocks the sun. Breaking dawn, which is like uh, when you're like, it's about to be morning and you can't think of any more fucking titles for your stupid books. And I'm not even going to touch Midnight Sun because if I wanted the vampire's perspective on things, I would have kept hooking up with that count from Sesame Street. Or rather, he would hook me up to his blood transfusion machine. I was a freelance human blood farm and it was going well, but then he started counting way too high. I'm not good with numbers past 15. I think the first thing I said about Twilight original was that I hate narration. Let me say it again. These violent delights have violent ends and in their triumph die like fire and powder which is they kiss, consume. Okay, Bella, I don't care that you had like two centuries old vampires suck on your arm in the last movie. Don't talk to us like you know how to reload a musket. In fact, sometimes I feel like this overwrought narration is the biggest suck job of the whole movie. Kind of like that indie project I did after college called Suck Job, the whole movie. Although honestly, I'm pretty proud of my dialogue in that film. I think it was quite successful. How come in her first person narration, Bella is like up in the studio with a copy of No Fear Shakespeare. But then when it comes time to talk in actual life, she's like, Are you doubting your mad skills? Bella, stop. I'm literally going to deactivate the airbags on my side of the vehicle in a second. Throughout this movie, we'll find out that Jacob has an extraordinarily easy grooming routine. He gets a haircut by simply magically shape-shifting or removing a wig. If you're a human like me, then you need a little bit more help. That's why I'm so grateful for the sponsor of today's video, Harry's, a razor brand that's reimagining the entire personal care industry. I recently got the Harry's starter set and was blown away 
away by how smooth and comfortable the shave was. And I love a brand that allows people to say no to the pink tax or unnecessary markups on products marketed towards women. Just look at what I got in the starter kit, which is only $3. First, Harry's has the sharpest blades ever, made in a centuries old German factory, and they give you such a close, comfortable shave. I was shocked. And Harry's is all about fair pricing. You can get an eight pack for as little as $2.12. The handles come in four neutral colors. I love my orange and blue handle. They have a textured grip and a weighted core that makes them really comfortable to use. And you can tell that Harry's is a company that cares, using 1% of their sales to support causes that really matter to me with a 100% money back guarantee and no pink tax. The starter kit also comes with a shave gel with aloe that allowed me to clean up my neckline. Harry's blades are safe for face and body. The gel also has a really fresh smell that I enjoyed and the travel blade cover is a breeze to snap on and put it in my bag. So if you're looking for a convenient and fair way to upgrade your grooming routine, then get a Harry's starter set for yourself, a $13 value for just $3 using the link in my description. Now let's find ourselves a werewolf to shave. What do you say? So the movie starts with kind of a scene from the third act, just a flash forward, where Bella is running through the town of Little Red Riding Hoods and seeing something shocking. And then she's like in this field and then she sees someone come out. I'll be honest, I was like, this is more surreal than I thought it would be. Grin. Nana, get out of my virginity garden. You're creeping out my vampire boyfriend. This is like a horror movie. But then the music shifts as the old lady gets closer and we realize that wasn't your grandma, sweetie. No, no, this is not a ghost. It is dun dun dun, Bella as an old lady. Run! Oh. How'd you get so old so fast? I didn't, it's not that old. Is that a gray hair? No way. Happy birthday. It's really funny. It's really not, but you know, good idea to set the audience's expectations of what you consider to be humor. That's pretty much the greatest intentional comedic height that the screenwriting ever reaches. So everyone just adjust your expectations accordingly. I never like that they try to sell Bella as like a funny cool girl. Cause I'm like, she's saying lame bland sh <laughs> with her long sleeve shirts on. This also kicks off Bella's first act aging crisis. I love how in the first movie, she could literally get dragged into the woods by a monster who wants to kill her. And she remained as stoic and pale as a marble statue. But now that she's with that monster romantically, turns out there is something she's afraid of. Looking old next to her boyfriend. Her mom is not in this movie. <laughs> so before the uh, gray hair comment, Charlie, is that his name? The dad gave her a digital camera and the mom gave her a scrapbook. And he was like, it's your mom's idea to uh, take memory pictures of your friend pictures, which don't get too attached to that as a plot device because it's literally introduced for nothing. Like they never take, what? I don't, okay. Let me take a picture of you guys. My mom wants me to put together like, scrapbook full of memories. Oh. Okay, it was a birthday gift, not a book report. Don't act like your mom is making you take pictures of your friends as homework. Also, don't act like your mom still exists in this movie just because she mailed you a fun activity. Also, Bella is like one of those people who does not like having people know it's her birthday. So basically this whole day revolves around Bella demanding that her friends revoke all mentions of her birthday. She's like, shh, come on, no, you know that I killed Bella. You know that I don't like, I don't like like people don't know that I was born on a date. Like, okay, Jehovah, we get it. But at some point, you're just drawing more attention to yourself by forcefully correcting all of your friends instead of just saying thanks and moving on. So anyway, she, she takes a picture of the core group of normies and then the Edward Cullen himself pulls up. I read about the car. In the book, it was like a Subaru. So he's in like a brand new Subaru model in this one that, that they promoted with him heavily. Yay. Okay, I feel like he could have parked a little bit closer. I mean, he might as well if he's just gonna showcase the car at a completely arbitrary spot. Also, it's a Nissan, not a Subaru. Sue me, Subaru, Subaru sue me. Ugh, this is such a long scene of him walking. I'm like, come on, come on, Edward.
And who was in charge for picking the music for this scene? And why did they choose to hire someone's dad who plays in a band? Do -do, do -do. The producer said, we're gonna give everyone in the audience what they want right at the top. A slow, casual stroll across the parking lot, which is like a money shot for teen girls and shy 20-somethings. The Aerosmith guitar vamping is for their stepdads and boyfriends. And for mom, a new compact SUV from Volvo. Shown with optional city safe features. It was, it's Volvo, not Nissan. What the, f like, what are these car names? They're so ugly. Sorry if you're, sorry if your name's Nissan or Volvo. <laughs> or maybe in other languages. Let me chill. Those producers even had something to satisfy me, the self important Nancy boy in the audience by giving me something to make fun of 12 years later online. Now that's what makes this film a classic. F you, Casablanca. Was the electric guitar even invented then? I rest my case. Bella is talking to Edward. If you recall, at the end of the last movie, she was really going at it, saying she wanted to be transformed into one of the cold ones, a vampire, so that she could live in eternity with Edward, even though he's like, are you sure? It sucks, like we hate it. It's one year older than you. I'm 109. Well, maybe I shouldn't be dating such an old man. Mm. It's gross. I should be thoroughly repulsed. Yeah, you should. And that would put you in the same boat as all of us with a working knowledge of how the brain works. It's weird as hell that a 109 year old person would even want to go to high school every day to look at under 18 year olds. Why is he so old mentally, but attracted to illegal aged people? Cause he could pass as a, like a undergrad of philosophy student at any state school. Then at least there's like a cool cafeteria. Edward, if you can train your body to be satisfied by only preying on the blood of animals, then you can also train your genitals to be satisfied by only preying on women 25 and older. Can't you just get whatever electroshock therapy they use to suppress Leonardo DiCaprio? Oh my gosh. Have you heard of the YouTube channel Girlfriend Reviews? Because Shelby from that channel, I love her. She DM'd me on Twitter and pointed out that Stephanie Myers is Mormon. And there are a lot of connections between Mormonism in the books, Bella is described as wearing floor length skirts and that's why she's always in long arms and cap sleeves, <laughs> you know? The way they like layer her up. It reminds me of this girl I did theater with. I'm not gonna say her name, but she dressed a lot like that. It was like every cardigan they sell at Kohl's. Oh, and in this series, Bella saves her virginity till after marriage and she refuses to terminate a pregnancy even when it's making her gravely ill. Shelby, thank you so much for that context. I am so I like it. <laughs> I don't like the Mormon church. I like knowing and seeing those uh, that allegory in the story. I am also going to talk later about the problematic race relations that are portrayed in this. But first, here's Jacob. I'm totally wigging out. Hello, biceps. No one seems so drastic if we hung out more. See, I know he's talking about his biceps being drastic, but all I'm hearing is the drastic nature of that custom hair piece. Everything he says is about the wig to me. This is the movie where Jacob cuts his hair. They don't explain that in this movie. It's really not even done on screen or mentioned, but for Bella's birthday, Jacob gives her a little dream catcher type deal. And then Edward is like, why does he get to give you gifts and I don't? And she's like, you're my gift because you're the star in the sun. And he's like, well, I love being your gift because I would vomit into your soul and sh in it later. And she's like, that's all I need for my birthday. <laughs> it's gross. I'm like, they're supposed to be 18 and 17 mm, vampire. There really were kids in my high school like that where they were like, no, no, uh, he's my soulmate. And it's like, you don't know that. You're stupid and young. And here we have Edward who's just straight up emotionally manipulative. Bella. Happy birthday. Shh, shh, shh. I thought I sent you presents. I've already seen you open it and guess what? You love it. I feel compelled to ask yet again, how many decades has Alice been pretending that she's not a vampire? Because I've only met her twice now and I already want to chase her out of town with a pitchfork just for being that girl in high school who pulls out gymnastic moves in the hallway. In fact, we're now gonna get a lot of very convenient reminders about what the Cullen's magical powers are. Nothing reminds me that the source material for these movies were young adult novels like when they forced 
person some clumsy exposition about mystical doings. Stop talking like this is the pilot episode of a supernatural teen drama called Sunlight Academy Realm Attendance or Glory Hole Girlies. Hmm, actually I like that one. In fact, I'm gonna change the name of my group chat to that that I'm in with some other local sluts. Anyway, Cullen kids, what other special powers can we look forward to on this season of Glory Hole Girlies? Glory Hole Girlies, <laughs> I can't say it. Are you lost, Glory Hole Girlie? You're gonna wear it tonight, our place. It'll be fun. Okay. <laughs> Jasper, no fair with the mood control thing. Sorry, Bella. Oh, the acting. Oh, Jasper, no fair with the mood control thing. Also, how come she can yell that vampire secret down the science wing, but Alice can't say happy birthday without getting shushed? I don't know what happens in the next book, but I feel like Bella is going to get hazed in college, whether they write it down or not. Furthermore, the only way Jasper controls my mood is by having a negative impact on it. And unfortunately, Alice and him are basically the only Cullens in this movie other than one scene. Also, later on, the whole plot becomes about how Bella is immune to all vampire powers. So I'm not sure how either of them are manipulating her into having a happy birthday right now. Is that explained in your precious book with the pages? Show you how to use nice things with nice flavors. Do you like to read the book with white pages? So the movie is making a lot of parallels to this cool indie book you might have heard of if you were into like scene stuff growing up, Romeo and Juliet. I know, we're really breaking new territory here. I hate being celebrated. Our worst tragedies. Look at Romeo. He killed his true love out of sheer stupidity. Uh, what stupidity? Because Romeo took his life using poison while Juliet was still asleep. Like, was it Romeo's stupidity that woke her up and made her stab herself with a dagger? I mean, indirectly he could be saying it's Romeo's fault for the friar. The point is, Edward either hasn't read this play or he needs to write a five paragraph essay explaining how Romeo's actions led to Juliet's death. Because it was not an obvious comparison to draw. I just think Stephanie Meyer is not as clever as a 14 year old might think. Like I remember reading quotes like these on like some stock photo of a foggy forest and it would just be like Edward Cullen. It's like, no, a stupid vampire didn't say that, just a bad writer. Okay, Edward comes out of nowhere with this. He's like, there's one thing I envied Romeo for. And she's like, what? Uh, suicide. For humans, a little poison, a dagger to the heart. So many different options. Uh, so anyway, I was thinking we could all do prom pictures at your house because you have those big, beautiful windows. But can you ask your family to brush out their freshly styled wigs before everyone gets there? When they get next to real humans, they look like straight up Annabelle. Bella is like, why would you say that? And he's like, you brought me there, baby. Why would you say that? She had to consider it once. I didn't know if I'd get you in time. What was the plan? Go to Italy and provoke the Volturi. The what? Yeah, the what? You can't just suddenly introduce new Italian vampire embassies and expect us to all be on the same page. Not everyone grew up in Europe like you did. Spanish flu, ooh, almost died. You had an entire first movie to at least mention that there were vampire laws that were being policed, especially since Edward was breaking that main law when he revealed to Bella his secret in the forest while also kind of threatening her with how hot he is. Everything about me invites you in. My voice, my face, even my smell. <gasps> Is that why your d smells like Cinnabon? I assumed you just really liked using that lotion from Bath and Body Works. Edward is so cool and learned that he can recite full passages of Shakespeare, iambic pentameter, and the whole class is like, oh, he's entrancing. Really dumb. Anyway, they later that night at Bella's birthday party at the Collins, he's giving more expositional talking about the Volturi, which they have a portrait of because Carlisle, the doctor dad, used to be the do do in it. Vampires have laws. And only one that's regularly enforced that we keep the existence of our kind a secret we don't make 
spectacles of ourselves. Okay, then they should probably write a ticket for Alice and let her know that she doesn't need to Gabby Douglas herself over every handrail while screaming about what she saw in the future. They should also probably stop attending high school and pretending it's normal to look the same over four years of adolescence. But anyway, Edward says he's not scared of the Volturi or anyone other than the idea of losing Bella. Bella's like, what about uh, Victoria, the redheaded vampire from the last movie? And he's like, eh, Alice will see you're coming and we'll, you know, prepare a cannon. But this little atrium conversation really gives us the full breadth of how committed these youngsters are to each other. I'm like, it's month three of knowing each other, so just chill. Oh, and then shortly after they enter the party, Bella's opening a card and you'll see, it's a lot. It's my job to protect you. Edward said, it's my job to protect you. Oh, a minor injury? I throw you into space! That, of course, caused Bella to bleed more, further triggering Jasper, who, if you recall, has the lowest, like, kind of self-control. He's the newest vampire. That's why he jumped up on her like a rabid dog. This marks the first of two hemorrhaging wounds that Bella pretty much ignores throughout the movie. But luckily, Carlisle is a doctor, so he's like, Bella, uh, hold a dirty napkin on that. I'm gonna go touch up my clothes clown white face paint and we'll get started on you in 10 or 15, okay? These actors are painted in full coverage bad shades. Why would they do CGI uh, red eyes, but they couldn't just do some CGI skin lightning so that you keep some of this, the texture and it doesn't look like face paint? Anyway, Bella is getting stitched up and she wonders out loud why Edward is against turning her into a vampire. And basically Carlisle reveals that Edward is, I guess, spiritual or religious and believes in the human soul. And he believes that vampires don't have a soul. So he wants Bella to go to heaven, essentially. Now I'm hearing the Mormonism, Shelby. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if that's Mormon particular, but it's God and God and monotheistic and I don't like it. To organize, Bella gets a ride home from Edward and it's really uncomfortable. Like things do feel cold. I was like, oh, what did you do, girl? But it was a, a very sudden. And like they have that she's like, can you at least kiss me? And it's like. <laughs> Sweetie, your boyfriend's body language is telling me you need to chew some gum in between eating dinner and asking for a kiss. Is that okay? Oh, it's just hard for him because he thinks her menstrual blood smells super delicious, right? I can say that. It's not illegal. You know what? When Stephanie Meyer wrote Edward Cullen, she was giving women everywhere a very insightful look into the struggle of being a man. As you can see from that kiss, it must be really hard to express love to a woman while also barely restraining the desire to murder her and possibly do stuff with her blood. I'm so glad the Twilight series is here to normalize that subdued rage and violence component. Normalize. I practiced this with her before. It's toast. It's toast. It's toast that she's so cute and pretty. Hi, Toasty. Do you like all the bright lights or you're not sure? She is always so confused by new things, but she, her tail is wagging, so she's not scared. I think she gets, uh, she doesn't like her stomach being exposed too much. Let me kiss you. Mwah. You're the cutest woman. <sighs> okay, yeah, so they share a pained kiss. Bless you, bless you. I love you. So anyway, Bella is left in the cold that night and then Edward stops coming to school along with all of the Cullens. I guess Edward breaks into her room and sees like a picture of them folded in half. I'm like, what? Why would she do that? She's like, I guess it's over. So I guess then Bella gets home and Edward decides to have the talk. Come take a walk with me. Oopsies, brace yourself, Bella. I hate the awkwardly distant, come take a walk with me. Mama, those are the opening chords to every breakup song ever written. Uh, no thanks. At least have the decency to break up with me indoors, at Walmart, in the bathroom that I just threw up in. I don't care if it is in front of all of your friends. I at least deserve that much respect. I at least deserve that. I know you chose the to noisiest toy to bring in here, huh? Crinkly, binkly, banana. A lot of dog interactions in this one. That's what you 
came to see. It's fitting because Jacob's a dog. We'll get there. Bella is basically dumped right in that smoky forest we love so much. He's like, we have to move because, what did they say? People are noticing that Carlisle didn't age over the last 10 years. Like, yeah, well, he is a doctor. He could probably do his own Botox. You could milk another 10 years out of that. So Bella's like, okay, well, I'll just think of a lie to tell my dad and I'll burn my social security card in a bushfire and I'll kill my stepmom. And he's like, no, you don't gotta do all that. Well, you, you, you can stay. And she's like embarrassingly like, I'm coming. It's like, girl, you leave the forest of shame. But she doesn't. <laughs> Edward has to be like, I don't want you to come. And she runs deeper into the forest. This is like that part of Snow White where the huntsman scares her and then she like gets hopelessly lost out of fear. All right, so just in case you're keeping score, Edward was like, uh, we're done here. And Bella was like, oh yeah, well I'll show you by laying down and dying in the woods. And I'm here to remind you of the myth. Oh, you get it. Ooh, good toy, honey. She's got her Halloween themed one. So yeah, it seems like Bella is laying on the ground for a long time. And also Charlie has a new best friend from the Quileute Nations tribe. I guess it was more of Jacob's dad in the last movie, who we only see once in this one. But something weird is happening in the forest when Bella comes to. Charlie. She's all right. I got her. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thanks half-naked guy who just handed me my unconscious teenage daughter. As long as you think she's all right, no further questions. We'll have the mayor send you a key to the city within two to three weeks. If this is the kind of investigation that their chief police officer runs for his own daughter, it makes it a lot less surprising how his biggest case that he's had open for two years now is trying to find out what kind of wild animal is killing side characters using human hands and human teeth. The mystery eludes him. They're like, is it a wolf or a bear? Wolf or a bear, which one uses red acrylic nails? So the search party's called off, Bella is found, and we have that roaming shot where we revolve around her showing all four seasons of her heartbreak. Also, someone from the past probably heard my future complaint that the uh, voiceover narration wasn't justified because now it is justified, at least like creatively, as the emails that Bella is writing to Alice. I don't know why Alice is like her confidant. They didn't really establish that when the Collins were there, maybe in the book. The pain is my only reminder that he was real, that you all were. You know what, Bella, you're lucky that none of these pathetic emails are going through. Emailing your ex-boyfriend's sister with your sad words is really embarrassing breakup behavior. If Edward disappeared like this to me on my 18th birthday, I would immediately be like, I got conned. Like, did I really just believe this wild story about some guy and his vampire family? When they're clearly just a rogue theater troupe full of compulsive liars who travel the country to incite chaos. Also, I get it. Charlie doesn't always know how to handle his teenage daughter, but I'm thinking it might be time to get some professional opinions when her month long relationship ended in 12 months of night terrors. Again, I'm, I suppose I'm supposed to be grateful that these emails justify the narration. But actually now I'm even more angry because now the plot device is what? That Bella keeps writing letters to no one? And the no one is shaped like your ex's pseudo sister in the same vampire coven? That's so, what? Can't you just have a journal, normal girl? I swear to God, like they really try to get away with minutes and minutes of runtime being just her to giving her emotional state and they explain it away by having her start the line with a one word. Alice, 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 dear Alice, 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 things are bad again. Alice doesn't care, Bella. Stop updating her on the daily ups and downs of your heartbreak. Like, is she supposed to be reporting all of this back to Edward? It's weird to think that. Also, he it's not going, the emails aren't working, so I don't get it. I'm fed up with Bella. Someone tell me what college she goes to and I'll make sure she gets hazed. I'll fucking do it myself. I'm just kidding. So Charlie d is nervous. He's like, so I noticed you're wasting away and your hair turned white and you have bed sores. Are you good? And she's like, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm going shopping today. 
with my friends who I never know the names of. Also, I'll say you can tell between the first movie and the second movie, which were probably shot very close together, it became evident that Kristen Stewart was uh, one of the highest paid actresses of the moment. Like, she just looks more expensive in this movie. I don't know what it is, but more delicate features. I don't know. Because she looks sick sometimes. <laughs> Never mind. Oh. I'm gonna uh, go shopping tomorrow with Jessica. I need a girls' night out. I don't know, Charlie. Seems a little suspicious. I think you have to throw her in the river, and if she floats, she's a witch. That's my only theory for why someone would be in a deep, messy ponytail depression, but still take the time to put on mascara and a single shade of neutral eyeshadow every day. That's some spooky dooky Hogwarts witchcraft. I don't trust it. Go to your prom. Go to your prom, witch. So, um, whatever Anna Kendrick's character's name is, Bella goes to the movie with her. I'm like, they go to the movies twice in this movie. <laughs> why? A two hour movie, has enough time for two movies <laughs> within the movie I want to cry but Anna Kendrick is the funniest person in the movie doesn't matter because Bella sees some danger oh and you should know also in their breakup conversation Edward was like just promise me you won't do anything to get yourself hurt it's like you don't get to know that <laughs> Keep walking. <laughs> this is dangerous. Uh, that's One-Eyed Pete's, the premier biker bar of Forks. So I think Bella will be very well looked after in there. In fact, almost every murder that's taken place on that property was over some woman who showed up accidentally. Also, I personally warned police captain Charlie in the last movie that he had a traveling group of mischievous young men on his hands who were harassing his little girl. But he spent all winter out looking for some mountain lion that might've killed his blue collar buddy, even though it doesn't exist. And now look, the roving Red Rover gang has acquired motorcycles. And in just a few months, they grew up to be completely different people. Bella is incensed that Edward's apparition would show up to warn her. And I'm like, well, it's definitely controlling to say, like he was like, I don't want you to come. And then you're gonna visibly show up to dissuade her from doing things. Can't you find an invisible way to help? That's some, so rude. Like you can't just be honest with her. And then when we find out the reason that he ran off, like does not compute. So. So Bella is annoyed that Edward is intruding on her new depressed life, and she's like, I'm gonna go f a biker. I promised it be as if you never existed. You lied. You say something, babe? You know what? Never mind. He said, eh, f it. I'm into delirious 16 year olds. Meanwhile, we got muttering Bella in the backseat. She's like, now I'm dating a guy who's just a couple decades older than me, but he's still likely to be the one who's going to cause my death. So, you know, I'm not a total prude. When he races off with Bella on the bike, uh, Edward appears in the middle of the road and she makes the biker stop short and she's like fully shaken by Edward's ability to pop up when she is doing these high adrenaline things. So it's safe to say Bella's becoming a bit of a thrill seeker. If a rush of danger is what it takes to see him, then that's what I'll find. Bella! Where the hell have you been, loca? <laughs> I'm clearly not mastering the chapter three Spanish vocab like you have been, loco. I hope your dad sees how hard you've been working to improve your quiz grades this quarter. I love how Bella just assumes that it's the adrenaline rush from thrilling activities that's conjuring clear Edward. Even though the vision of Edward himself was like, no dummy, I'm trying to stop you from doing stuff that will get you killed, because that's what I ask. He's like, if you got a rush out of reading science fiction books, I would not be clear and visible to you now. Bella's got a plan. She found two motorcycles. I'm like, why do you need two? And she's gonna have Jacob help her fix them up at a great time and expense. And I'm like, oh yeah. People will do whatever they want for like their crush or their love. Or sometimes it's just bartering with sex. That's fine too. Do what you do. Get the motorcycle running. You know what I mean? Ugh, I don't like how long and drawn out this movie is. Like sh surely some of these scenes could have been cut. Like we hear from some of the other people on the reservation that uh, Jacob lives on. They have fun. Quill's actually taking his cousin to prom. You want funny, Black? I'll give you funny. <laughs> 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 
Oh. This movie places an unrealistic expectation on young men. And not just about having washboard abs and custom lace fronts, but also that they're supposed to get into recreational anywhere wrestling moves as like some form of friendly bonding. I guess that could be foreshadowing to the part of how they're all wolves. But what does that mean for Bella's dad? Is he just immature? Charlie's been coming over here for a good natured tumble play date ever since the mom left. You know how much I love a montage and the music in these Twilight movies, I'm like, it's so early 2000s, late early 2000s, late early. It's so late 2000s, like, ooh. Bella isn't even aware that Jacob is a werewolf at this point. And even if she was, that would still be the weirdest possible way to hand pizza to a human or a wild dog. Does being a wolf mean he has spidey senses for when food is thrown? He just went and the pizza just looked weird. Like it disappeared into his hand mouth. Even before that, Bella was weirding me out just by diving into that pizza box while the delivery driver was still holding it. Like he's not getting paid to be your coffee table, pizza bellissima. He's just like, I'm gonna make no expression and get my SAG card. Yeah, the, the CGI that they clearly needed to pull off such an amazing effect was not worth the money, I guarantee it. It's so blurry and weird. Bella is still screaming in her sleep. It's like, I can't stand. It does sound like really pained and I, as always, stan Kristen Stewart, but this is screaming that happened like four or five times in the first act. I'm like, she needs some Ativan. Listen. Like, are you having a kidney stone? What? So Bella is driving Jacob home and they see some of his friends jumping off a cliff and she gets so scared because they're like kind of throwing him one guy off. So she pulls over. They're cliff diving. Scary as hell, but a total rush. Yeah, you don't have to explain to Bella what diving off a cliff would feel like. Just like you, she's got a perfectly good partially human, partially dog brain. They are really trying to lay it on thick that Bella is now the evil Knievel of Forks, Washington. Like she needs to find the biggest and baddest rush that she can. That's why he was like, total rush. Foreshadow. She just wants adrenaline because she thinks that will make her heart feel better. I'm like, yeah, girl, look around your state. I'm sure that's the reason a lot of people tried heroin, but that's not an option for Stephanie Meyer's perfect version of the world. So Bella's like, Ugh, I need to be like death defying. So I'm gonna have my birthday party at the indoor skydiving place. The names of these kids, Embry and Paul and Sam is the leader. And it seems like Sam is kind of being a bad influence over some of his friends. That's Embry. What happened to him? All of a sudden he started following Sam around like a little puppy. Sam keeps giving me this look. Like he's waiting for me or something. It's kind of starting to freak me out. I feel like uh, the director decided that for this scene and this scene only, Jacob's character would talk low and grumbly like a werewolf because suddenly that's all I can hear and think about in the universe. He's like, it's kind of freaking me out how you could eat the doggy chow and the chow chow and the biscuit, the biscuit. How much is that doggy in the window? Woof woof. Like what? Do you have heartworm? So anyway, something is up within the ranks of the werewolves because it's also not mentioned, but I, I presume that those kids who were brought over to the dark side, that's when they cut their hair. But I don't like that they introduce these characters from across a CGI cliff. Like, I don't know what they look Look like or who they who, who's who thankfully for Jacob Bella has really good advice for a friend who says they're scared of someone in their community oh, you should just avoid him oh good idea Bella sort of like your boyfriend avoided saying goodbye to you before disappearing on the eve of your birthday yeah that's what I thought you know what go ahead why don't you go jump off that cliff it's scary as hell but a total rush <laughs> okay so it's time for Bella to test out the bikes that they finally prepared and you know Edward ghost is up on it. Now, I'm not a doctor, uh, but that looked to me like it would leave someone with the face of a kicked in jack-o'-lantern. But for some reason, after Bella takes a tumble, there's hardly any damage other than massive blood loss and some shy girl apologies. Oh. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Well, it's just blood, Bella. No big deal. Uh, I think what you meant to say was... 
I love how he's like, it's just the blood, it's not a big deal. I'm like, it's not not a big deal. Did you see that accident? She just got into a high speed collision with no helmet, full body slam, skeleton into boulder. Of course, these uh, Twilight Universers are like, oh, our young girl is injured. We must wrap her in more layers of unbreathable plaid. Sweet, modest fleece. Like, no thanks, get your dirty sweatshirt off my bloody flesh wound. Appreciate it. I love when uh, there's like special effects makeup in movies and people have to touch it or not touch it. Like they'll be cleaning a wound and they just like do one little spot. Uh, Bella does this thing where she touches, she cups her hand so she's actually touching nothing. <laughs> you want it to stay the same looking and not get it on your hand. You have to be careful so that it looks the same in every take. But I'm like, oh, I hit my head. Okay, girl. But she's not in, I thought this was gonna be a bigger deal. Like she was in the hospital with like trauma wounds when a car didn't even hit her. And this time she crashed into a boulder. Bella was like really distant from her friends, but today she is finally coming around because as she tells Alice in a letter, Jacob is helping her feel herself again. Oh, and then Mike, uh, the guy who had a crush on her the whole first movie is so annoying. He's like, so you're you're not depressed and you're single? Why don't we do the movie? And she's like, we can, I'll go. And she's like, I can't do romance. Something, uh, action. Uh, how about face punch? Have you heard of that? Um, guns, adrenaline. Bella. Is this your way of trying to warn us there's about to be a robbery? Stop acting like this is your first time buying weed. Why are you talking weird? And don't ask questions that you already know the answer to. Of course Mike knows about face punch. He's probably the mayor of face punches. So then nobody shows up except for Jacob, who she for some reason invites. So it's Jacob and Mike. And Mike is scared of the movie and he throws up. And I'm like, it's an action movie, not a horror movie. <sighs> but this whole, this whole subplot could have been cut or drastically reduced. Jacob's like, you need a man who laughs at the gore that makes weaker men vomit. That's a verbatim quote. I remember it because it sucks. <laughs> so anyway, in the movie theater, Jacob does try to make a move on Bella. And even though she's like, I will nuzzle your neck skin, but uh, I still have a boyfriend that hates me. <sighs> well, he doesn't hate her. He shows up in her Fruit Loops milk sometimes, I guess. So anyway, there's this new best friend Charlie has from the Quileute tribe. And they're going out yet again to hunt down whatever animal it was that killed some local. I don't even, like, it's very inconsequential. The, like, peripheral characters that get killed in these movies. It's like, old River Dan? Not him. That was my dad's best friend. It's always Charlie's best friend. It's like, chill. Okay, so after the movie, Jacob's dad tells Bella that Jacob has mono, and so she can't visit. And so she's feeling really lonely again, because, see, there's, like, he became her best friend. So she gets in that red, rusty truck and drives on to the reservation. And then we see Jacob with his hair cut short and his hair cut short. Someone snatched his wig off and became a bad wolf influence. It's raining a lot and Bella is really despondent. She's like, I, I have no one if, it, if you, I lose you. But still, I feel like she's always has him at an emotional arm's length. It never seems like they're a couple or she's leading him on to me. I mean, a stupid man might think that, but they're stupid. I promised I wouldn't hurt you, Bella. And this is me keeping that promise. Go home and don't come back. Bella, I really think we should listen to him. It seems like rainwater is vaporizing off the heat radiating in his boy p Actually, you know, that's probably not his preferred terminology if he's a werewolf. Radiating in his dog's vagina. That sounds even weirder to me, but today's climate, you gotta be PC. So Bella is now officially the biggest loser on earth, despite kind of, she could live her life and be single now, but she doesn't see it that way. She goes to the field that they laid in with flowers and it's dried up. I'm like, I get it, I get it, I get it. She's sad. And while she's in that field, one of the evil vampires, the guy with dreadlocks appears and he's like, Victoria sent me because she really wants your ass, Bella, because she smells so good to them. Then he's like, you know what? But I'm going to just kill you here myself. And I'm like, then why did you do a favor for Victoria? Anyway. I'll make it quick. You feel nothing. Wait, why would you step away from someone if you're about to drink their blood? I think he's getting his thing confused with the Jedi mind tricks. He said, don't worry, I'll make this quick as he starts loading himself into a human cannon. Thank goodness helpless Bella doesn't die here. Not because of the strength of her own will or cleverness. No, 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 no. A wolf the size of the Empire State Building jumps out of the forest and a whole group of them actually and they chase the vampire away. So Bella is terrified. She thinks these animals are what's the dad's been looking for. So she tells them, she's like, you have to go catch these mountainous wolves. But you can tell she's a little suspicious because that night Jacob shows up. <laughs> Bella. 
Good work, Jacob. You just found the most shark boy and lava girl way of entering the house. I know that might've technically saved you some time over using the door and stairs, but I mean, I wouldn't count on anyone up there still wanting to sleep with you after you start jumping around like a hyperactive dinosaur kid after eating birthday cake. Gee whiz. Gee whiz, Jacob. So Jacob is like, there are things I wish I could tell you and it would all make sense. And he's like, just remember what I told you about the creation myth of my people. And she's like, yeah, you said, we're talking about the cold ones. And he's like, figures, that's what you remember. For all of us, we know that the myth was that they were descended from wolves. This is really a twisted version that Stephanie Meyer made of the actual creation myth for the Quileute tribe, which is a real tribe in the Washington area, which doesn't make it great that they show the kids as like a pack of high school dropouts that act like animals. That's a little racist, a lot racist, especially since there is a lot of financial struggle, or there has been like as recently as 2020 with these reservations. Poverty is pervasive. There is a high dropout rate. So for Stephanie Meyer to like make that seem like it's not a matter of privilege, but actually because they have werewolf tendencies that take them away from their studies, that's so dumb and really harmful. Anyway, Jacob hugs her without a shirt. I'm like, why didn't you wear a shirt here? Why didn't you wear a shirt here? I guess it's like the Hulk. Like you can't wear a shirt because once you werewolf out, it'll rip. But he's, he's, he's always got cargo shorts on. He's wearing like Bermuda shorts 90% of the time here. So anyway, uh, Jacob is basically like, I'm sorry, but we can't see each other anymore. It's dangerous for you. And so then she, the next day, barges onto the reservation and gets into a confrontation with that bad influence, Sam and Embry and Paul. And he's like, what did he tell you? Like, he's clearly suspicious that whatever this tribal secret is, basically that's what Jacob implied. He was like, there's this secret that they're making me keep. And I mean, it sounds really uh, sinister. I would be like, are you getting abused? Which is maybe what she had in mind when she went over there, but it's just a bunch of underage nipples. <laughs> what do you tell you? Both of you calm nothing. down. He tells me nothing because he's scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one of these actors is making their fake laughter sound real forced. I know it's you in the back there, Jared, the beta of Sam Yuley's pack and the one with the most obviously airbrushed on abdominal muscles. He delivered that chuckle like he was tying a maiden to some train tracks. <laughs> oh, to be fair, the other young one, Embry, also sounds too much like he's acting. Because after Bella punches Sam, he turns into a werewolf and she starts running and then Jacob comes out and he also turns into a werewolf. So she's shocked and they werewolf into the distance. So they have to bring Bella back to the house. The dogs are going nuts. And listen to what Embry says. It's like, ooh, get a new take, get another take. So wolf's out of the bag. Is it possible that everything is true? Fairy tales and horror stories, that there isn't anything sane or normal at all? <laughs> oh, what kind of cuckoo ca Mrs. Robinson, Jesus loves you more than you could know, whoa, whoa. What was that? I already don't like how Stephanie Meyer has to show every young man in Jacob's tribe walking around with their tan shorts and their bald, shiny sternums, but it really makes my skin crawl whenever she has the teenagers act like puppies. I read an article on thetempest.com by Afia Scheich talking about the harmful way the Twilight books and movies portray Native Americans, specifically the real Quileute tribe. Their myth about the creator turning some men into to wolves is portrayed in Twilight to be like the proof that the tribe is the enemy against the Cullen family. As this article points out, indigenous communities have long been villainized by narratives and modern storytelling. So from the first movie, they portray the Quileute people as the bad guys. Oh, and for all of her billion and billion of dollar, Stephanie Meyer didn't give a single one of them to any of these underserved Quileute communities. Like she explained exploited them by name. She was like, um, I think I've done enough by putting their little powwow group on the map. Now it's a tourist destination. People pay to take walking tours and have a selfie with one of the brown kids from Twilight. All right, Stephanie. All right, Stephanie. So these two kids are like, okay, we're gonna go in. Emily is in there. That's Sam's girlfriend or wife. And he's like, don't stare. And she's like, why would I stare? You could be much less mysterious. About Emily, Sam's fiance, don't stare. It bugs Sam. You guys hungry? Like I have to ask. <laughs> Who's this? 
Oh, I'm the Phantom of the Opera, and I've come to spread the good word about one-sided hockey masks. And I'm not saying that Emily's facial scarring is scary and needs to be covered. I actually just feel bad for her that she has to have that awful latex prosthetics glued to her face. It looks so much like pancake batter that those two teen wolf twinks keep trying to lick it off her face like a German shepherd. Anyway, this article that I'll link below makes I think a very astute point that Stephanie Meyer, quote, uses the darker skinned Native Americans to contrast against her super white vampires and uses their folklore to paint them in a civilizing light. This is following the narrative so often used by settler communities in North America and by introducing it into popular culture, Myers sets a dangerous precedent. And I uh, totally see the point there. It's like kids are not gonna be able to identify the microaggressions that are woven into this plot because like you I didn't I wouldn't I didn't see it either as an adult until reading you know someone much smarter's analysis of it so after reading that it becomes shockingly obvious how problematic this story is like poor Emily got her face scratched up because her werewolf boyfriend Sam lost his temper when she made him mad meanwhile pasty faced Edward Cullen worships Bella and controls his bloodlust and like and suppresses his desire to, to drink her blood because he's that civilized. He eats animals to satisfy his thirst and uses Shakespeare books to stimulate his prostate or whatever. Also, look at the patriarchs, dads on Edward's side and Jacob's side of the love triangle. Carlisle, the vampire, is like, he puts on his best, most stark white face every morning and goes and works at the hospital to help mortal people while also suppressing his desire to drink their bodies because he has that much self-control. Meanwhile, Jacob's dad from the Quileute tribe is Billy Black, who has an almost irrational hate for the Cullens, to the point where he doesn't want to get treated at a hospital that Carlisle works at. And Carlisle's in there like, oh, you're not coming in? Really? We have a wheelchair ramp and everything. Don't you want to come into the nice, clean, crisp, white, colonial medical environment? Isn't that going to be so much better with real medicine and not just like hopping around a bonfire or whatever? Again, that's the colonial... POV of this narrative, not me saying it. Ugh. Don't take those things out of context. Anyway, I think the writer of this article really sums it up by saying indigenous communities have suffered at the hands of white settlers since 1492. And yes, that might be true as long as you can track down a history book that wasn't written by the favorite grandson of some old guy who literally had enslaved people on his plantation through the roaring 20s. The way history is so sanitized and suppressed in this country, not good. I didn't say I have solutions. I'm just pointing out the problem. Okay. But anyway, these boys are starting to like Bella because she's cool enough to run with the wolves. Although she still seems to be under the assumption that they're the ones doing the killing. Well, can't you find a way to just stop? I mean, it's wrong. It's not a lifestyle choice, Bella. I was born this way. I can't help it. I was born this way. I can't help it. I want to know what was going on with Kristen Stewart on this day of production that prevented her from being present in the scene? It seems like to me. Like, she's under the assumption that Jacob is part of the Quileute tribe who have been systematically tearing apart townsfolk. Again, great representation. So, like, with that understanding, why is this the line delivery? Stop. I mean, it's wrong. Honey, if you think your sad girl side piece is compulsively killing people, why are you asking him to stop like it's the same thing as smoking clove cigarettes occasionally? He's like, we are not killing people. That's someone else. That's one of your vampire redheads. And then he lets them know, he's like, oh, we can take care of her though. We killed that dreadlock one. It's like, then they flash back to it. I'm like, they couldn't have made that part of the sequence, like an action sequence. They had a time for the movie one and two in theater scene. Okay, okay, okay. So Jacob and the other other shapeshifters who developed or something to like protect the tribe from the Cullens. They're out hunting for Victoria and Bella's like left to her own device. I guess she's never heard of a crossword puzzle. Jacob's gone. He's hunting Victoria. And you're gone. And so is Edward. And there's just nothing 
I mean, didn't you wanna like be a ballerina when you were a little kid? You could take a dance class, apply to some colleges, read a book about codependency, go nuts. Next, we have a very tense scene where Charlie's friend is out hunting down wolves and Victoria, the redheaded, angry vampire is zooming around and he's like looking for her. Oh, and so yeah, the vampire attacks him and then a wolf saves him. Meanwhile, Bella is like running to the cliffs again. And then she kind of just runs and jumps off. No, she doesn't. She pictures it. Oh no, Victoria jumps off into the water, the vampire. I don't know why Bella sees this and jumps in. Maybe she doesn't realize what's going on. Oh no, with all those long sleeves and layers of fabric, she's gonna absorb seawater and sink like a stone. Then we know she's not a witch from earlier. Again, I love how ever since Bella learned that she likes the rush of adrenaline, New Moon becomes like a Mormon version of that movie from 2009 with Jason Statham, where he has to like keep his adrenaline up to keep his artificial heart pumping. So he like clamps his nipples to a car battery and makes love to some woman on a motorcycle. Oh God, I hope I'm not just like imagining any of those details. The woman on the motorcycle was played by me, right? Oh, yep. Yeah. Producers confirmed yes. I was in the movie Crank High Voltage as Patty, the motorcycle slam tunnel. Thanks, producers. Good take, everyone. That's a wrap. It is scary when she's underwater from cliff diving and she sees redhead Victoria swimming at her like a shark, but uh, thank God there's always a f***ing knight in shining armor to rescue her from near death again because Jacob pulls her out and he's she's like, I just wanted to see something. It's like, you know that boyfriend of yours shows up completely unsolid. How is he gonna catch you if you're dying? So uh, Bella and what's his name are getting cozy. I guess they have a really high metabolism as a wolf. It must be nice never getting cold. <laughs> It's a wolf thing. It's a Jacob thing. Okay, well, in the last movie, you liked your boyfriends to be icy sub-zero vampires. So which is it? Which is it, Bella? You have to tell us which you like more. Warm dick or cold dick. And obviously no judgment. I mean, who doesn't like a slice of leftover pizza straight out of the fridge? You know what I mean? <laughs> The pizza secretly stands for something else. In the writing world, they call that d symbolism. And for some reason, I'm really good at it. Bella and Jacob spend so much time with their faces close to each other. I just know their blackheads were touching. <gasps> oh, right. He smells a vampire right when they get there and it's Alice. She's back. And so Bella is like thrilled. She's there because she had a vision of Bella ending her life, jumping off the cliff. And Bella's like, no, no, no. I was just doing it because I'm stupid. So they talk about, and oh, Alice is like, well, Edward thinks that you tried to kill yourself. So now he's trying to kill himself in Italy. We gotta go. And then they almost kiss the other two. Bella is gonna be playing truth or dare at a slumber party and be like, seriously, I've never had sex and I've only made out with two people. Well, two things, a much older vampire and a slightly younger dog. Okay, now I pick dare. So Stephanie has to prank order a pizza. Right before they kiss, <laughs> Edward, I don't know what Edward's magic is now. He can just see Bella all the time. Cause right before they kiss, he calls and he says a few words to Jacob. And it's like, that's not your house anyway. Why'd you answer the phone? And Bella's like, why didn't you let me talk to him. He's the only thing I care about. But anyway, a nice clean shot of a Virgin Airways plane later and Bella and Alice have landed in Italy. They show Edward like appealing to the Volturi asking for them to destroy him. And they're like, no, we're not doing that. You're too valuable. And so Alice is like, well, his backup plan is to reveal himself in the sun at noon. And then the Volturi will have no chance but to end him. So it's a race against time in this yellow car. Oh, and she's like, why is everyone wearing red and it's like this special festival day celebrating the day they chased the vampires out of Italy. I'm like, ooh, this does not sound like real history. And everyone has the same and Handmaid's Tale robes. Like where did they, who sewed all of these for them? Why do they all look identical? They look like the um, monsters from the village. So right as the clock's about to strike noon and like one little girl turns around and sees Edward coming out and sparkling, Bella has the slow motion heart attack of a lifetime. Look at me, I'm alive. 
You have to move. Bella, no one wants to listen to the girl who just ran through a fountain with her shoes on. You're gonna have a whole flight back to America with damp sneakers now. Enjoy that athlete's foot. That was a cultural landmark, by the way, thanks. Edward's plan to reveal himself at this festival as a means of ending his own life is really hard to grasp. And I watched this movie three times. I still couldn't get it straight without the help of the wonderful people at twilightsaga.fandom.com slash wiki slash what the f Before Edward hinted that his plan, if he ever lost Bella, would be to provoke the Volturi. And I guess that's the only surefire way to end a vampire's life. Even though they did it to some other vampires by ripping them apart. So I guess for Edward, walking outside and shimmering in public is the radical act of rebellion he's gonna end it all with. But we never even get a clue what the Voltori's wrath is like. Like we never see them kill someone else for a discretion, indiscretion or have anything to demonstrate why we should be afraid of them. We haven't really even seen them all together in a room. By the time I like made up some reasoning for what I was seeing, they had already moved on to another plot point. Not usually the goal with screenwriting. I also find it so unrealistic and cheesy that Edward smells Bella's herbal essences and is like, heaven. Cause again, what did he expect to happen that he would be instantly killed step out into the sun like the Volturi haven't are they see, are they seeing everything but when he realizes it's not heaven and it's real life he rushes inside you know because he thought Bella was dead but now he has a reason to live I'm here. <sighs> Oh wow, those two really phoned it in with the acting on the second one, didn't they? Is that what vampires think overwhelming relief and happiness looks like? Because that was kind of the same pained expression he had when Bella made him kiss. But don't worry, the next character introduced won't be half-assing their performance. Cause she's a veteran actress who's been working since age fetus. Because child labor laws don't exist in Hollywood as long as you do a math worksheet once every three hours. Bring in the child star. No. Arrow sent me to see what was taking so long. Okay, those threatening glances alone helped this movie earn its MTV Movie Awards Movie Award of the Year. What kind of name is that? She did not hold back on selling the drama. She said, Count Chocula sent me to get some skim milk. I felt at the time and I still feel like they cast Dakota Fanning to be the shockingly young, frozen in time head of the vampires, sort of like Kirsten Dunst played in Interview with the Vampire. But I, I also feel like they expected her to show up on set still an eight year old, like when she was in Cat in the Hat, because she's like, a, I think she was maybe like 16 or 17 or 18, but you know, she kind of just looks like a young adult. Maybe that wasn't their intention with the casting, but it, it felt like it could have been cool if they cast a little girl, that would be really interesting. And also, she makes it seem like vampire children can just hang out in an Italian castle. So why are the Cullens fucking around with first period gym class in Washington for the rest of their eternal lives? Like, I hate the Cullen family. They're so tacky and stupid. So I don't really, no rules were broken, but they're still in trouble. I don't know why. Oh, cause they wanna see Bella. I guess this was all a plan to see Bella. Oh my God, this like eight minutes in the third act where the Volturi and Michael Sheen's character is like, I can't read your mind and I can normally read your person's whole memory when I touch them. And oh, uh, little girl blue, Dakota, she says like pain to Edward and he has like the worst pain of his life, I guess. And then when he try, she tries to do it to Bella, it doesn't work. So they're like, how do vampire things don't work on you? And that would also explain why Edward can read everyone's mind except her, which was one of the original reasons, aside from her weirdly good smell, that he loved her mentally they didn't have sex yet so uh they're like oh we want to see what how that special anomaly changes once you become a vampire like you'll be very powerful if you're immune to other vampires so he's like gonna kill her but then alice is like no i'm gonna change her see and she touches michael sheen and is able to give her give him an a vision of the future i'm like when did all of this become a thing and i have to tell like this is after eight minutes of cgi werewolf vampire throwing tiles breaking noises.
That's how I felt escaping into the woods outside of rehab with the paranoid new guy who snuck in drugs. I guess Alice just made up this vision and transmitted it into Michael Sheen's character. Like, I don't know how I'm supposed to be afraid of the Voltori if she can just easily deceive them. I mean, they did mention like, Alice sees a future, but the future can change. Like, so then she's just guessing. Like, wouldn't the Voltori be smart enough to be like, I see that she changed into a vampire, but also into a colonial slip dress? She looks like that woman from the mental hospital in Good Burger. <laughs> Why vampires wear peasant clothes? Just for the mood. So the this lie that Alice has agreed to change Bella is how they escape basically from her being killed right there. They're like, okay, go do it, go do it. And back at home, Edward finally starts to reckon with the hurtful way that he abandoned Bella. Every time Charlie opens his door, Edward's like, oh, whoop, diving under the covers. Dad, you don't have to worry. Yeah, last time you said that you took off, I didn't see you for three days. Um, police chief Charlie had called out a search party to look for Bella's remains when she was just late for dinner one night. Granted, she did almost die the same night. Not great that she just ran into the woods and then lost the will to live, but you know, there's always a man there to help her survive and thrive. Someone with big arms to lift up little Bella Swan. You can almost count the examples of Bella being a weak lead character based solely on how often they show a gentleman carrying her because she just like literally couldn't that day. So I'm just, I find it strange that after three days of his daughter being missing, like Charlie wasn't out kicking the Cullens to death like uh, Liam Neeson trying to find his, his, his taken girl. Charlie should have been out there curb stomping vampires, ripping apart bobcats with his bare hands. Edward is so annoying. Like, what do you want from her? I honestly don't know how to live without you. Once Alice changes me. She won't need to change you. There are always ways to keep the Volturi in the dark. Ugh, Edward, you just said you could never live without her. So, I mean, why not just go ahead and make her immortal now while her mucous membranes are still plump with moisture? Like, pretty soon you're not gonna look similar in age, which I mean, you're not similar in age, but it'll look opposite. I bet you he's just stalling so he can freeze her at age 40 because he wants to look like Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore, which was very trendy then. I love how this f scene Bella is like never leave me again and Edward was like not only will I never leave you again but if you ever leave me I will find some way to vampire kill myself in the middle of an Italian kids party or something like girl you both need to tap the brakes on this we have some weird neural pathways being carved out in Bella's trauma mind meanwhile Edward is 130 and should definitely know better this is the only scene I think where the whole Colin family is I still laugh at myself for thinking that the Colin mom was played by Paget Brewster. <laughs> Cause now they're very, I see that they're very different people. I don't know how I got that so wrong. Like I'm, I'm always looking at the IMDB page. The actor's name is Elizabeth Reeser. She's from like the Ouija. She was the mom in the Ouija movies. That's probably, I saw that just a few weeks before this. Anyway, she, you know, hugs the whole family for the, you know, this is the second time we see them, I guess. And she asks to them to vote on whether she should be changed or not. This sort of feels like when and the parents have to sign a waiver to let two 16 year olds marry each other. It's like, why do kids need to get married? I would be like, you kids can be vampires together later. Cause you, like, I mean, if I were any of the Colin family, I'd be like, we kind of hate this bitch. We hope that you break up with her. So we're not trying to have her stuck in our house as an eternal roommate. I vote yes. It would be nice to not want to kill you all the time. <gasps> That's fully Pennywise and a commercial for makeup remover. Yeah, it would be nice for all of us if you no longer wanted to kill Bella all the time. Because frankly, Jasper, it's embarrassing how you never go through with it. You look like the mushroom creatures in Super Mario to me. <laughs> so even though they know Edward's stance on it, it is voted that she can be changed into a vampire if she wants. Oh, and she wants. She's like, if you don't fucking chew on this with those sharp, sharp teeth. But then outside the house, somehow shirtless Jacob is just, you know what? The, I don't think Jacob like enters a scene without coming out of the woods. Like what? He lives on an Indian reservation and drives a car, not climbing through the wood. I guess he's a werewolf still, really weird. The kind of jealousy between Jacob and Edward really comes to the surface for the first time in this confrontation. You don't speak for her. <laughs> Mmm, wow. 
I think that really cool shove would be even more powerful if this thematic score had some lyrics. Hit it. Now we have a wolf. You pushed him and then he became a wolf. Jacob just took that childish shove and did a backflip while shape-shifting into a different species. Yes, the showmanship. That is high drag, mama. He knows what he's doing. These two age-old family feud. Stop! You can't hurt each other without hurting me! Well, your feelings and safety are secondary. Was that not obvious by how often a man has been luring you away from your high school and into the woods alone? You've been hit by rocks, fallen off cliffs, riding with bad boys. Like, you can't do anything without hurting you. You hurt yourself all the time. What are they gonna do? Werewolf fight? So anyway, Jacob does walk off, you know, for now. They're not gonna have a battle of Hogwarts. And it seems like now Edward has finally conceded that, all right, we're going to turn you into a vampire. He has one condition for her. What's the condition? Marry me, Bella. <gasps> she is stunned. She's gonna be like, he asked me to marry him and it was just like I always dreamed, except it was more of a command and he didn't get down on one knee and it wasn't in front of Cinderella Castle at Magic Kingdom like I always talk about. And my foot is in wolf right now, but okay, married. I feel like Kristen Stewart had to record that little gasp in post because her face barely registers that she was just given that shocking ultimatum. <laughs> or maybe that's like, she's just really happy. That could be the face of someone who just felt like a year's worth of egg cells drop into her tubes. I mean, I don't know if that's a thing or if it would feel good, but similarly, I did once get a cue ball lost inside of me and I made the same kind of face when I found it and it nearly shattered my toilet bowl. <gasps> it's the end of the video and I just made a joke about sitting on the toilet. Ugh. That's more of a beginning of the video anecdote, just as you're sitting down to enjoy your snack. Well, f you popcorn, Susie. I sh out a billiards table on a Wednesday night and you have to live with it. So anyway, I guess this means there'll be a wedding in the next movie, doesn't it? What would a vampire who transcends time <laughs> and society even want the institution of marriage for? Like what, who is that helping if you're literally the devil or whatever? Anyway, you know that wedding scene is gonna introduce a whole bunch of kooky Cullens from the extended family, right? They'll be like, my vampire power is turning water into wine, cheers. Mine is being able to catch the bouquet easily. Mine is driving home with a blood alcohol level that's above the legal limit. Like, oh no, Uncle Jerry, it's gonna be cheesy. I can't wait. An Adam's Family reunion, but with fangs. Join us for the sideshow in Forks, Washington, home of the displaced indigenous people. <laughs> this is me gasping like Kristen Stewart. <gasps> I wonder how many flies she ate while doing that. I can't get into the math, but thank you all so much for watching. Which, do you think this is better than the first movie or the first movie's better? I think the first one, I think was a little bit better, just I mean, more contained of a story. This really got lost in the middle of the whole thing in Italy. I was like, this is too long. So let me know your thoughts and opinions below. But most importantly, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. Let's me know that you wanna see the next Twilight review even faster than if I'm left to my own devices. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I've got a war. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can get exclusive content and virtual watch parties. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for wolf hunting in Washington with me today. I will see you next time.